Father, I thank you for your word. It's powerful. Sharper than two edges word. I pray for ears that can hear and hearts that can receive. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be talking about the testing of your faith, of your faith or our faith, and the law of expectation. When I was in Bible school, they were teaching us, us about the law of expectation and how we can be, you know, you can only get what you expect. We have to be people that when we come here on Sunday morning, we have to be expecting. You see, you can keep going to a place. It can become a tradition that you go there all the time to the point that now you don't expect anything. <laughs> Actually, you can come to church without expecting anything. God wants us to expect. And your faith is somehow wrapped up in your expectation. When you come here on Sunday, well, I'm just going because everybody else is going. My grandpa used to tell us, now, there's no truth to this story, but they use this story to kind of instill in us something that when we go, when we have to expect something. My grandpa told us that three people went to God. Three, three of them. One was a white man. The other one was an Asian. And the other one was a black man. Now, there's, there's, there's just for the purpose of learning, I'm telling you this story. So the white man stood before God, and God said, what do you want? He said, I want wisdom. I want knowledge. God said, well, you got it. And then the Asian was asked, what do you want? He said, I want money. Oh, yeah, you can have money. Asians, they love money. They work hard. They love to work so they can have money. Nothing wrong with that. And then the black man was asked, what do you want? He said, why did you come? He said, I don't know. What do you want? I said, I don't want anything. I said, well, you got what you want. Now, there's no truth to this story, but my grandpa was saying, when you go to God, you have to know what you want. You see, it's very easy. You ask a lot of young people, well, what are you going to be when you finish school? What do they say? I don't know. <laughs> hey, have you heard that? I don't know. There's no, they don't expect anything. They're happy with not having anything. And we can come to the house of the Lord. We even don't know why we came. We can be sitting there. The God of angel army. We can even sing that song. But we don't know what we want. What do you want? Solomon. A little boy. God appeared to him. Second Chronicles chapter 7. There you read. God appeared to Solomon. And he said. What do you want? And Solomon. Was. Very so wise. He knew what he wanted. He didn't waver between. I want money. No he didn't ask. Well, maybe I need this. No he said. Lord that I may have wisdom. And God said, it's given to you. But because you did not ask for money, I'll give it to you. God was so pleased with Solomon because Solomon asked for the right thing. Oh, I wish we can ask for the right thing. When we come here on Sunday, there is so much that you can ask God for. Maybe you have money in your account. Because we always think that's what we should ask. Maybe your bills are, are all paid. But you can sit here. Maybe you have everything in order in your house. But maybe you can come to church on Sunday and begin to sit here and say, Lord, today I'm going to go there. Maybe I don't have anything to ask from my bucket list. How about I ask something for that person there? 
How about I ask something for the city of Regina? People are going to hell in this city. They don't know Jesus. Oh, Lord, give me a heart that can cry. Like the heart of Jeremiah, he wept for the city of Jerusalem. He repented for their sins. He cried for them. That means it's not about you now. You're crying for somebody else. Actually, if you're a person who can cry for somebody else, need, God will meet all your needs. Can somebody say amen? If you can cry for somebody else's need and weep for their need, God will meet your needs because he knows that you're going to be busy interceding for some people. My goodness, I believe that we have to come to church with expectation. If we can really understand the law of expectation, means we are going to church, I believe God is going to do something there tomorrow. Lord, I looked at my bucket list. Oh, maybe I don't have money. Maybe I need some healing. Maybe I need this. I need my kids to be on order. All the bucket lists you have, if you prayed for all of them and you feel, because the place where you're going to backslide, many of us backslide. Many of us actually become disconnected from God when our needs are all met. And then we think, now I've arrived. But this is not about me. My goodness, a prayer meeting, what was Jesus doing praying for one hour? Have you ever asked yourself? Can you pray for an hour? It's very hard. For half an hour, it's very hard. But if you can take your focus from yourself and you take the focus to others, you can pray for one million years, if so be it. Because it's not about you. See, the reason Jesus was able to pray at the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed there for one hour, was because Jesus was not full of himself. He was thinking about you and I. He was thinking about all of us. And Christ is teaching, he's teaching us to take our focus off ourselves and think about somebody else. So when we come here on Sunday, oh my goodness, let us come expecting. We are supposed to grow in our expectation. Now I'm using the word expectation so you can understand. Actually, I can say we need to grow in our faith. Because faith is walking in expectation of something that is going to come into our lives. Can somebody say amen? I wanted you to read. We want to look at Job chapter 17, verse 18. He said, what is man that you make so much of him and that you give him so much attention and that you examine him every morning and test him every moment? How many of you feel like it? You're being examined and you're being tested. And a lot of us don't like to be tested. You see, testing is part of God trying to grow you. He created you, and he has to test you. He has given you faith, and he has to test if that faith is working in you. Test, we don't like it. In fact, we live in a, I hear nowadays, you can graduate even without it going through a test. They are trying to push that. Right, everybody gets a trophy. That reminds me of uh, uh, Sune Minar in that song there, the millennials. <laughs> you get trophies for, for participating. Eh? You get a trophy for participating, for showing up, even if you don't work for it. I'm telling you, we don't want, we don't want to be like that. They are trying to get out in schools. They are trying to abolish awards. You know, where kids that did well, they, give, they, get, they get given an award. They want to take that out. So everybody is the same. But the reality is when you get to life, it's not like that. You have to work hard. You have to pursue. There's nothing wrong. In fact, the Bible talks about God. He detests people that are lazy. Laziness is not part of God's plan for you. He's called us to be 
people that are very diligent. Amen? So here, you're, you're going to be tested. You have faith, you're going to be tested. But the test is not easy, and a lot of people don't like. Let's look at James chapter 1, verse 3 to 6. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James chapter 1 verse 3 to 6. The testing of your faith is very, very important to God. God wants to test your faith, and that's why you're going through difficulties. And how is he doing it? He allows difficulties to come to you to see if you can handle it. I remember I saw a video of uh, they have this big truck. They want to see how that truck can carry load. And they, all the shock, the shock observers in them were tested, and then they took it to a very rough place. And they drove it really rough to see how it can take the tension that is getting from that truck. And God is, God is taking us through those rough, difficult times because he wants to see if you are able to observe it because he has given you shock observers. Your faith can handle that. Can somebody say amen? He has given you everything that you need to handle the tension. But then we think, oh my goodness, I'm going through all this because the devil, or maybe because, oh, I'm giving up. So we give up even before we start through the, the test, we run away. And that's why James is telling us that, brethren, count it all joy when you go through all kinds of trials. Count it as joy because it is in the end of the test, you win. How many of you know that promotion comes right after the test? Sounds like us talking there, my sister. <laughs> when I was in Moose Jaw, many people don't know that. I was planning to come to Regina since 2000 to start the church. And my pastor, I, I, I listen to when pastors talk, I, we go and ask, and if they say no, we say okay. Our pastors are there for a reason. A lot of people say, oh, pastor, you are my pastor. As soon as you want to tell them something, they Well, don't call me a pastor then. They like to tell you what to do. So I, I asked, and he said, no, you can't go to Regina now. Let's serve the Lord in, in Moose Job. People are getting saved, Pastor David, said here. Oh, man, I want to come to Regina. There are more people. I can talk to them. <laughs> so we drive, me and my wife. In the weekends, we can drive here. Oh, man, we want to be here. But we're in Musja. So, But then, one day I decided, I'm just going to stay in Musja. I'm going to serve the Lord in Musja. I'm going to live in Musja, serve the Lord as if Jesus is coming tomorrow. And if he comes tomorrow, then we don't even have to do anything. But at least if he comes, he will find me with my hands on the plow. Well, because, see, if I just leave Moose Jaw, because there was a time I was so full of Regina that there was nothing happening in Moose Jaw. In fact, all the people that I'm getting are running away because I, I have no desire. You know, you can know if somebody's really excited about you. They see that Pastor David is not for us now. He's thinking about Regina now. So I'm not able to encourage them anymore. I was not able to pray for them anymore. During prayer, we're praying my thoughts are all in Regina, not Musa. So the people are all getting scattered. The, the Bible calls it calls that double-minded. Being double-minded. You're neither here nor there. God said, this kind of people, you will not get anything from God if you are double-minded. So I decided, okay, Regina, I'll take you 
and put you in the cell. Not forgetting that. I'll put you there, but I'll just focus here. Because if I focus here, and I do this well, if I succeed here, then God will promote me there. Because God is, God cannot bless laziness. God cannot promote a failure. God wants to promote you because you are faithful here. And then he will promote you there. So I forgot about Regina, not completely. But, but I did here, I was so excited. So that when I left Muzjo, I left Muzjo in, out of a place of victory. God wants to promote you from victory to victory. Not from failure to victory, no. From victory to victory. So be faithful at that job that God has given you. Let your boss count on you where you are working that you are the best worker. If you are serving the Lord in this church, do it with all your heart. Then God will give you something great. Amen? But you know what? If you are not faithful here, why would God give you another one? The Bible says if you are not faithful with that which is another man, why would God give you your own? And I, I'm telling you, we want to serve the Lord this year, here, coming fall, even now, as if this is the last thing we are doing and he's coming tomorrow. Because I know some of you have a plan to be somewhere. And that's a good thing. But only people that are faithful here can go somewhere. God loves faithfulness. Eh? Kids, if you can clean your room, eh? if mom is telling you to clean your room, you are not cleaning it, chances are your house is going to be dirty. If, oh, when I have mine, one day I will clean. No. You have to clean this one, which is not yours. Because God is going to promote you because you are faithful here, and then he will take you to another one. I'm just bugging kids because I can get away with it. <laughs> hey, Nolan, that room. Avi. That room, brother. <laughs> Jimera. <laughs> How are you, brother? <laughs> oh, man. God will promote you if you are faithful. You know, I used to think my parents are up to They are trying to fill my joy. That's what I thought. They were into stealing my joy of going to the river and diving into the water, even though crocodiles are there. But now I came to know my family, my parents love me. And I'm telling you, many of you are thinking, Mom and Dad, there's so much rules. They're telling me to do that. No, no, they're not there to fight you. They're there to, because they, and if you know, see, King David understood that. King David understood what it was to be with when he was just David, and King, da and King Saul was his enemy, but King Saul was his boss, and King Saul actually took a spear and threw at him, and he moved, and the spear went and stuck on the wall. What kind of boss is this? The next day, he showed up to work again. Who will show up to work if your boss threw a spear on you? <laughs> I'm telling you, David had a different spirit. David understood one thing. See, Saul, Saul was the first king of Israel. He was chosen not by God, but by the people. And the Holy Spirit came on Saul. There's nothing wrong with Saul. But Saul, he did his own thing. He didn't follow through with Samuel, the prophet, who was giving him guidance. And he did his own thing. And Saul, would love, he's a man pleaser. I'm telling you, the time is coming. If you're going to be pleasing people, you will not do anything. Because if you do this, they will say, oh, if you do this, the worst thing is to be the Prime Minister of Canada, or the President of the United States. 
You can give me billions of dollars. I will not take that job. Because I'm happy. If I have to come to the church, there's no security planning for it. Bodyguards and all that. I'm so free, I can go and eat ice cream here. Those guys, they don't do that. They, they have been imprisoned in their own desires. Now they're, they're leading. Justin Trudeau is not free. You do this, is wrong. You do that, is bad. You want to, everybody's criticizing you. Hey? Saul, of all the kings of Israel, he had the anointing of God on him. And David recognized that. David knew that Saul had the anointing of God on him. Not because David was, because Saul was perfect. So for that reason, David chose not to hurt him because of the position that God has put him in. The position your mom is in, kids, is a very good position. God put them there. At least honor that place. The place of a mom and dad. Maybe mom is not perfect, but the place that God has put them in, honor that place. That's why David honored Saul, even though he took a spear. He moved away, and the next day he showed up again. And you know what was he doing? His job was? Like Philip here with the guitar. Because they, Saul was possessed by evil spirit. You see, when you disobey God all the time, you are inviting evil spirits into your life. If you don't confess your sins, if God is telling you don't do things and you keep doing it, you are allowing evil spirit to come into your life. You become depressed. You can recognize people. A lot of people are struggling with depression in North America, even in Canada, and many times we think it is a medical problem. Most of it is just rebellion, sin that is taking root in our heart. We just keep doing things the way it, we were doing, and we're expecting a different result. That man was depressed by evil spirit. And what happened? They bring David. David was anointed. He plays his guitar. The God of angels are me. He's always by my side. La, 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 la. And, the, and Saul was sitting there in his throne. And then after a while, the God of angels are me. And the Bible said the evil spirit left Saul because of the presence of the Lord. Because David was leading worship. And that's why when we come here, I'm telling you, you don't see it. I know it. All kinds of spirits leave. Because that's why praise and worship is very powerful. How dare can we come here and sit like this? We break that spirit of Saul out of this church. We want the spirit of David. The God of angel army. Wow. And David was worshiping. And Saul was the beneficiary of the anointing. When the worship team is leading us, we are the one that benefits. Open your mouth. Oh, enter in. You can benefit something. Hallelujah. And if you can go home. Now, this is the thing. You go home and there are two different worlds. The world in church is anointed. Praise God. And then we go home, and we are back into the devil's territory. How can we take this home? How can we take this home? Take your YouTube. You can play, they God of angels are me. Don't play Lady Gaga. That's the devil's army will show up there. You need to put on praise in your house. I go to Willie's house. Man, you can't help it. Right outside, he has a boom box. Hill songs. Hallelujah. <laughs> Coming out of the window. I can hear it. Praise God. 
the God of angels army, devils are flying out of there at home. And when you're here, they fly. But when you go home, what happened? But Saul, the spirit of Saul is that kind of spirit that only depends on David. You see, we can become like Saul. Oh, I can wait until David comes and when he plays his guitar and he sings, then the spirit will leave. But after David also has to go home, right? The praise and worship is here and Sunday morning is here. But how can we take this so it becomes our lifestyle? That we can kick devils out. We don't need David to be there. But Saul couldn't do that. He depended on David to do it. Even as evil as Saul was, David could not touch him. He could not point a finger at him. He, he stayed there, and David, you know, the test was not Saul. The test was for David. God wanted to see if David can apply what he learned. So David was faithful, even when a spear is being thrown to him. He stayed there, and God promoted him. He became the next king of Israel. He became the man after God's own heart. God will not promote you when you fail. In fact, one day, King David, when, they, when Saul was pursuing him all day, and Saul got tired, and Saul was sleeping in the cave, and David came there, and he saw Saul sleeping. He was so tired. I'm telling you, if you're serving the devil, you're going to be tired. Pursuing things, endless dream. So David came there, he saw Saul sleeping. And David's bodyguard, how many of you know you can have somebody next to you as yes, your bodyguard or your friend who can give you a wrong advice? So David, actually, according to the world wisdom, here is your chance, you're the next king of Israel. He's sleeping. Cut his head off. This is like, oh yeah. In fact, he told him, right now you do that, you're the next king of Israel. It's over. He was pursuing you. He took a spear and he threw at you. So now is your chance. Pin him down. David told him. So he took a knife, cut the hem of his garment. He said, leave him. He said, you will not touch the anointed of the Lord. So all is anointed. He was throwing his spear at the people. Yes, he was anointed. Regardless of throwing spears at people, of all the evil things he did, the position he was in is anointed. That is to tell you, when God put people in a position, watch out. You will find yourself in a place where you are fighting God. God knows they are not perfect. God put them there. He will take them out. David left it for God to do his work. And he persevered. He, he was tested. That was a test for David. If he would have killed Saul, he would not be the, the next king of Israel. And many of us are going to be tested. And his friend is telling him, here's your chance. He said, his bodyguard, he said, no. I'm not going to do that. You're going to be tested. The testing of your faith is necessary because God wants to promote you. Are you going through difficult times? Maybe financial, maybe emotional, maybe marriage, maybe kids, maybe all kinds of things. This is a test because God wants to promote you. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Let's look at another scripture. Let's go to 1 Peter 1, 6 to 7. 1 Peter 1, 6 to 7. 1 Peter 1, verse 6 to 7. Uh, here it says, For a little while you have had to suffer great and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith may be proved genuine. These things have come so that your faith can be proved genuine. You know, like our sister, you know, your kids are in the Philippines. You're here. You know what? 
kind of faith is needed in this hour to fight a situation where a husband and wife are separated because she has to work here in Canada and the kids are in the Philippines. Praise God, we have Skype. You can talk to them, but it's not the same. The difficulties. And then you lose your job, and then you have to wait to get a job and to get your permanent residency and all those kinds of things. You see, it's a time of testing. But it also ends with promotion. Can somebody say amen? For a little while, you have had to suffer a great and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise. Hallelujah. So when your faith is tested, the end result of it is to give God praise to the extent that you've been testing, tested. The greater your test, it's a place for you, as the scripture said, that pain, pain may tarry through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Can somebody say amen? Weeping may tarry through the night, but in the morning there is joy. Joy, I'm telling you, tell me, somebody who has suffered. And then in the end, he gets what he wants. I'm telling you, and he comes here, he will praise God like better than anybody else. Hallelujah. Wow. Have you suffered loss of things, things difficulty, and God has answered your prayers? I will see it from the way you praise him. You will not care what people think about you. Because you want to praise him. But I'm telling you, we all know that Jesus did for us something far greater than paying our bills. He's done greater things. He's done greater things. He wrote your name in the book of life. Amen. Isn't that something great that we can get excited about? Hey? Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. So your faith is tested so that it can be proved if it is genuine or it is false. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is testing you so he can refine you. God is testing you so he can refine you. We have a refinery here. How many of you drive by it when you go to the dump? Somewhere here on McDonald Street. There's a refinery going there. <laughs> that place... As soon as I go like this, I thought I was going to hit a car or something. Somebody on because of my eyes are, oh, what is that? They're refining, but the smell is not very good. Eh? The smell is not very good. And then they have a big tank there where all the impurities that are taken out of the refinery is dumped there. And then they get the quality gasoline for us to drive our cars. But if you look at the smoke and the fire that is going on there, there's a lot of heating that is going on in that place. And this reminds us of, of God being the refiner. He's refining us, but the process of refinery is not easy, it's painful, it's hot. Am I speaking to somebody? You're, we go through this time, the testing of your faith. Let's look at Isaiah 48, verse 10. He said, I have refined you, though not as silver, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Affliction. Wow, that's what we don't like. But I'm telling you, God is trying to test us. The Bible frequently compares our problems and difficulties to a furnace. The furnace of refiner's fire who heats it up so high that the gold and silver melt and all the impurities are burned so that the best come out of it. Hallelujah. The best is yet to come, guys. When we go through difficult times, you need to begin to praise the Lord. You need to begin to worship the Lord. You know, see your attitude. Last week we talked about attitude. It's the smallest thing that makes a big difference. It's a very small, but your attitude 
It's very important. How do you handle things when your life is difficult? An old silversmith, who was, he was asked, how do you know when the impurities are burnt away in the silver? As he was doing the refining, he said, when I can see my reflection in the silver, when I can see my reflection in the silver, then I know that the silver has been refined. And God is that refiner, and he's looking at you. He said, I'm not seeing my reflection in you. And he turns the heat. <laughs> yeah, he wants to see it. He's refining us because he wants to see his reflection in us. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Somebody praise the Lord. And the time is coming when people will say, well, I have seen beer and I've seen Jesus. Because he sees you and the reflection of Jesus is reflected. That's why the Bible says, let your light shine. That light is reflected from the Father. He's refining us to purify us so he can see himself in us. And if somebody look at us, they see Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Somebody praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. I thought, my goodness, I was reading that. I said, isn't that true? That silversmith guy actually had a revelation. How do you know that you are done refining your silver? He said, I only know when I can see my reflection in the silver. God is not done with you. He's not done with me until he can see his reflection in you. Oh, and people look at you. I can give you another example. Moses. How are we going to get the reflection of God in us? Now, he said he's refining us so that he can see his reflection in us. But how is that? How, how can that be done? How can... How can we get to the place where the people see us and they see the reflection of God? We have to be willing to be refined. Are you willing to be refined? Are you ready to be refined? See, God never forces himself on somebody. You have to be willing to say, here, my Lord. Isaiah chapter 60, chapter 6, verse 1. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on his throne. The description there, and he said, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. And the angel took the coal and touched his mouth, and he was refined. You see, we can be refined. Can somebody say amen? God wants to refine you. He wants to refine me. And if people are going to see us, they will see that reflection of God in us. If they see us, they see Jesus. All the impurities are burned out in Jesus' name. Wow, that's a powerful thing. But we have to be willing to position ourselves to be willing to be refined. It, it is very painful, but God is able to deliver us from it. If he's the one refining us, he will make sure that we are not totally, utterly destroyed. We will come pure on the other side. The refining process is painful, but the outcome of it is a reflection that everybody can see. The refining process. You need to ask yourself, are the difficulties that you are going through part of the refining, or is it from the devil, because we always push everything that is happening is from the devil. Sometimes it's difficulties with getting along with people. But that's part of the refinery. <laughs> eh? Part of the refinery requires other people. 
difficulties at home, difficult, where you, there's no getting along with friends, you are not getting along. That is part of the refinery. Don't run away from it. Actually, it's not the other person's fault. It's you getting polished up. God wants to reflect his light through you to get rid of the impurities. Maybe he wants you to teach you to forgive. He wants to teach you to forget. Sometimes you lose your money. You make money, but you're not enjoying it. And uh, maybe God wants to get your attention because you trust in your money too much. I don't know. Maybe it's just you don't know how to handle it. See, there are all kinds of things that are going, but if you can go to Jesus, if you can go to him, if you can go to him in prayer and ask him to forgive you of your sins, I'm telling you, he will cleanse you. He will purify you. He will refine you. The refinery fire. God wants to cleanse you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to purify you. Why not we stand and close?